Hi, I'm Hallermouth, and I'm here to do a uh, review of one chapter of the Dark Phoenix Saga, along with a few other members of the comic book community. My chapter is uh, The Fate of the Phoenix, it's X-Men 137, from 1980. Written by Chris Claremont, co plotted by John Byrne, drawn by John Byrne, with uh, amazing inks by uh, Terry Austin. And just to give you a little taste of what this was like, an amazing splash page. Okay, so at this time, the X-Men were 17 years old. I think it's really significant to point out that the YouTube community is sitting here doing the, these uh, this chain of reviews of each chapter of the Dark Phoenix Saga because this should be the uh, 50th anniversary of the X-Men if I've done my math right, which I really haven't heard a big whole lot of uh, hoopla from, uh, from Marvel. So, um, Dark Phoenix Saga, according to comic book lore, and everything I'm saying is lore, things I've heard over the years and stuff and collecting comics, is that Marvel was in a building in New York, it still is, you know, but in that building where their uh, offices were, in the lobby there's this infamous Chinese restaurant I've always sort of heard mentioned here and there, and there's a lot of important meetings. They'd go downstairs, shoot some ideas around, have editorial meetings while they're eating Chinese food. You know, so I could just imagine being a fly on the wall of that place. And uh, Jim Shooter just sort of realized, he was editor-in-chief at the time, that, you know, it, he felt that it was time for the X-Men to have you know, uh, an arch foe, an ultimate enemy. You know, much like Fantastic Four had Doctor Doom. And considering that the X-Men were around for 17 years at that time, and it just really surprised me to kind of recall that because in my mind Magneto is always their ultimate arch foe but this kind of makes sense because up to this time Magneto is sort of more or less uh, you know hung around with guys called the Toad and uh, hung out in carnivals you know so that was the meeting it was Jim Shooter I think Roger Stern was the editor at, time, at that time somehow Jim Sally Cripp's name comes up every now and then and of course it was John Byrne and Chris Claremont and he kind of gave them a go-ahead, all right? So what they were going to do is start building up a character who's going to be the arch, arch foe of the uh, X-Men, and that was going to be the Dark Phoenix, according to comic book lore. But some things happened all the way. One of the reasons the Dark Phoenix is probably a huge success, or, and, or was a huge success at the time, is that this thing did not have the big advertising machine behind it. It did not have the big push. It didn't have anything. This was done through storytelling, because of two creators getting told, here's the ball, and run with it, and look what we got. One of the biggest stories at Marvel of all time, probably one of the top three, if not the top one, but that's another video for a, another argument there, you know, debate. Um, so what had happened, though, is that the story didn't quite go as the way that Jim Shooter thought everybody had agreed on at this dinner. And, of course, he, he is, you know, part of the editor-in-chief's job is that he's kind of kind of protect this universe, make things, sure things stay, in, you know, people act in character, and nobody really does anything to mess up the sandbox. And uh, as he was doing his editorial duties, you know, months later and stuff, uh, the legend goes that the, the uh, issue 136 came over, you know, his desk to be approved. And he saw how Jean Grey, as Dark Phoenix, wiped out five billion people by destroying a sun and a planet that was uh, inhabited planet that was going around the sun and then it took out a I think it was a Shi'ar warship or something killing a couple hundred more and right there Jim Shooter had to come in and if I remember we'll, re we'll return to the rest of that story at the end of the video okay um, one of the themes that goes on with the X-Men is that they were always outcast and uh, this time, what has happened is, is that it was kind of ironic because what, is, what has happened in the Dark Phoenix Saga is that they became the ultimate outcast. They became the outcast of not only, you know, Earth, where they were outcast to begin with because they were mutants, you know, feared and loathed by, you know, everybody because of how they were born. But now they have the Kree, the Shi'ar, and the Skrulls. You know, coming together. These and and it's it's almost it's an uneasy kind of truce because now the Dark Phoenix, by destroying that uh, sun and that planet, has shown she's a greater threat than Galactus, and she's to be terminated. So they get together to do this, and the X Men are just standing there on their own. You know, they uh, 
they're there and they and you know when you kind of look at the structure of the story the moon is the perfect place for the story to take place on because there's nobody else on it it's just the x-men against the universe and if they don't they've all the all the uh alien races have agreed that if we don't take out gene the dark the phoenix there's going to destroy the solar system so this is on an epic scale right. we open up with the watcher and at this time and as it should still stand the watcher always shows up when there's something major about to go down uh, for the planet earth and he's just allowed to watch and he kind of narrates for us catches us up to speed and the first thing you see is that x-men have been transported the ultimate outcast now to them against the universe now that's how i read it you know they go back to sort of what the x-men were supposed to be and they're on trial gene is on trial with three alien races that i mentioned beforehand and um uh, you know she's more or less to be executed but thanks to charles xavier he stands up and he calls for a duel of honor okay he has learned about the uh shiar culture due to be involved with lolanda and you know all the friends have uh you know the panels in this tell the story also man even though the phoenix has supposedly taken over gene they still stand by her and all these panels show the x-men clinging to her and, and surrounding her and supporting her and jeans you know has guilt over what the phoenix made her do so the duel of honor is uh called the aaron in heller that's how i'm reading it you know i don't speak shiar you know i don't even speak klingon and uh so the next morning uh after the supreme intelligence and the queen of the scrolls and lalandra have all talked you know they've all agreed that it's going to happen and nobody's happy about it so we have nights where or during the night while they're waiting the next morning all the x-men are just sort of uh in you know in their quarters or training or getting ready nervously walking around doing what they do and they're all going through their head we got that uh you know what's going on in their head what are they thinking you know and uh, you know gene is thinking maybe this is how it you know it should be you know uh, Nightcrawler's thinking about, uh, you know, the Holocaust of the of the Jews back in World War II. And we'll get back to that. Um, you know, and he's off this game while he's training there. Wolverine just sort of like, he knows he loves Gene, you know, doing his thing. Colossus is thinking. And then the, the one that really got me was um, Storm. Because she understands having that power where she was worshipped as a goddess in Africa. And she has the power of the, over the element and stuff. So she understands getting overwhelmed. So she's going to side by Gene. But then we come to, to Cyclops. We come to Gene. Gene comes back. She's abandoned her Phoenix wardrobe and has gone back to Marvel Girl. And it comes down to these two. Which was a major theme that I think was really missed um, by a lot of people. Or just not acknowledged you know we all know they were in love we all know it was all romance and lovey-dovey and stuff that was also a major theme in there which we'll talk about in a minute then they come to the moon okay and I think the moon placing this on the blue area of the moon itself says something about being an outcast is that they were outcasts nobody's coming to help them nobody's coming to save them nobody's there to take up for them and you can see out here here's the earth okay and then where we have on the moon we have you know x-men by themselves this is all they have that small number of people and it's like the world's against them then you go back here and you look and it's like the universe is against them right now all because they're sticking by gene they have, all they have is each other and uh and then the imperial guard comes in and it's the duel of honor going on and the imperial guard is the shiar imperial elite uh not quite their superheroes if you will but they're a loose interpretation by marvel of the legion of superheroes so it's kind of fun to go through there and see who's fighting who and you got to remember dave cockerham was the penciler before john byrne on the x-men before that he was redesigning the legion of superheroes nightcrawler was actually designed to be a member of the legion of superheroes so there's also kind of like little in jokes in there and stuff like that so actually i think it might have been more appropriate to have dave cochran come in and draw you know this fight you know because this, this fight is built on what he built and x-men are taken down one by one and you know there's a little nod to uh one of the first appearances of the watcher wolverine ends up going into the watcher's uh 
building he gets knocked down during battle or something we have a little recreation of uh, how the watcher was kind of first seen in an early issue of Fantastic Four with Wolverine doing it this time um, you know there's some good sci-fi elements there so like I said one by one they go all hope is lost and it comes down to Scott and Jean I'm going to come back to this page because it should have come down to Scott and Jean. We'll talk about that in depth in a minute. And of course the Imperial Guard comes down. They're coming down after them. More and more of them all rally of the Imperial Guard come after Scott and Jean. They're all flying down there. And the battle ensues. And we get some great storytelling and artwork by uh, John Byrne and Terry Austin. So all hope is lost and what's going on, the phoenix comes out. She freaks out. Bam, phoenix is back. Everybody's panicking and now it's down to the X-Men to take them down because I think she took out the whole Imperial Guard as phoenix. And now we have the X-Men turning on her. We even get a reverse, uh, thanks to the moon's lighter gravity, we get the classic fastball special but instead of Wolverine getting thrown by Colossus, Wolverine throws Colossus. And it just goes downhill from there. And we come into the part of redemption. After killing the five billion people in the warship, the CR and stuff, Jean, Jean self-sacrifices herself. She puts it to where she ends up activating a gun on the blue vent. Uh, I'm probably, I don't know what it was for, but uh, she activates it and then she lets it kill her. Scott is crushed. The battle is over. And we've lost Jean. And we get nice exposition from the Watcher. Alright, yes, that was touching. So, let's get on to why was this story so good. Okay? The, the, the themes in here are, it seems like the themes in here are about love and power. And there's a lot of irony going on. Okay? It's about empowerment. Back when Jean became the Phoenix, I think, in like X-Men 101, she got empowered as a superhero. Okay? All of a sudden, she was just like, her telekinesis worked on a molecular level, you know. She was able to, she got the power to where she could hold Scott's eye beams back to look into his eyes. I mean, it was actually kind of scary to be around her. But what was amazing is that even though superhero-wise, story-wise, she became empowered with power, but it also empowered her as a character. All of a sudden, Jean had a different voice than she did before. She wasn't so much in the background. She wasn't just a member. She wasn't a plot device. She wasn't for, you know, have a little something with Scott and her going on to make it interesting and stuff. She got a voice in it. And it was just, to me, it was ironic because uh, when she was empowered in the book with a much stronger voice, Jean was a mutant who ended up being more human despite having this entity inside of her that should have made her more than human, which it did. Um, and it actually made her a bit more of an outcast within a group of outcasts. Okay, she was, she, now that she's more powerful and stuff, she's talking to Xavier on more of a, of a level field here for a female character to be doing that in a book at this time. Um, she was kind of taking charge. She was telling Scott things were going to be all right. She was kind of taking care of Scott. And uh, in the stories that kind of show, she became more of a central figure. It's all of a sudden, you know, she became the Billy of the Kid of the group. Everybody wants to take down the fastest gunslinger so they can get a reputation. Um, she also became the ultimate victim all of a sudden, okay? And that's where we get into some of the subcontext that Byrne and Claremont stuck in there with the book. I'm going with the Hellfire Club here. Um... The Hellfire Club is more or less based on an episode of the old Avengers TV show where there was a rich kind of club and you had Emma Peel walking around much like the outfit that Jean Grey wore when she was the Black Queen. Okay, um, They were fans of the show and they kind of stuck it in there and that was kind of fun and people figured it out over the years and stuff. Um, and what happened was his mastermind, who was a master of illusion from the original Brotherhood of Evil Mutants came in and as you saw in the other reviews, he traded illusions, got in Jean's mind. And what this was is that the Hellfire Club showed how all of a sudden, man, we're seeing another human side of Jean. We're seeing the sexualized side. All, what they did is they pumped sexuality in this thing. They're in dominatrix outfits. Uh, they're showing a lot of skin. It's kink. It's, I mean, this is called what it is. It's a bunch of wrench people with a lot of fetishes, you know, trying not to be bored. And they brought in, and what happened was those that she became the ultimate victim because by mastermind getting in her head, 
this was symbolic of her being raped. She completely came under his spell. I mean, it's almost like she was he was under her control. This is like seeing the good girl that you grew up with next door uh, starting to date the bad boy of town. You know who's going. You know you know he's going to jail and stuff. The one that the mom and dads and you just you just know her. It's like Harley Quinn with the Joker. If I had to, you know, keep him in there. But he merely raped her, and he more or less raped her her soul first. It was this being a victim that probably let the Dark Phoenix take hold and make her lash out after being a victim. The victim became the predator, okay? Um, and another thing is, is the outfit. It kind of showed how Jean had become empowered as a character and how it, uh, the dominatrix outfit came in and showed that that's the ultimate empowerment. It's you know, sexually, that's the, supposed to be the ultimate empowerment when you're the one in control. When you have that dominatrix outfit, you're the one calling the shots. But much like Mastermind's power of illusion, this concept is also an illusion because it's actually the submissive who has all the power. And I won't get into that, you know. But um, started out, Mastermind thought he was in control. And Jean was able to break the spell there that she has over him. And the person who is in control with Mastermind ends up having nothing. He's left a vegetable when she breaks free of him. So the victim broke free of her predator, and Jean's again empowered again, but this is this causes the phoenix just to go off. Now another theme in there besides empowerment is the, and, and Jean was also, before I get off the empowerment, Jean also self-sacrificed herself. This character actually became the ultimate victim, lashed out, the victim becomes, you know, the predator, and how else does she empower herself? She chooses her fate. She chooses that she is going to be the one to die. So she was also empowered all the way to the end. She also chose to go back to being Marvel Girl. All right, she chose her costume. She got empowered against the Phoenix. She did not let the Phoenix win. The Phoenix had a hold of her. And Jean, the character, became empowered in her own right and fought off the Phoenix. And by doing that, she chose her fate and died. I think I said that three times. I think you get my point. All right, the other thing was love. This was actually an ultimate love story, in a way. Better than Twilight, you know. Anything's better than Twilight. Um, it was a story of Scott and Jean. Becoming empowered may have made her more, you know, having the phoenix in her, this entity, this cosmic entity, all of a sudden is inside of a human body. And I kind of think that kind of, it had an intoxicating effect on Jean. This is where she became more aggressive as a lover, more aggressive in the relationship with she and Jean, yet it was still based on love. So it wasn't anything perverted when you put it up against her role in the Hellfire Club as the Black Queen. When you take what Scott and Jean had out in the desert and hold it back his eye beam so they can actually kind of look each other in the eyes and have an intimate moment when you get to the kink and the nastiness of the Hellfire Club, it was a beautiful story about Gene. What they were doing is they were humanizing, they were giving us a humanizing effect with Gene. They were trying to make us kind of fall in love with her the way Scott was. You know, Scott was in love with her again, but now we see it through his eyes and what Gene is doing and everything that's going on with these two. It's almost like we were supposed to fall in love with her because they knew in the end, you know, this wasn't going to end well one way or the other. And it's those moments with Gene and stuff that we actually started caring about Gene. Is caring about it. That's why the story was so good. We cared about Gene. We had three years of Gene Grey getting built up and being the center of attention and, and seeing the love triangle, how characters fall in love with her, Wolverine and, and Cyclops fighting over her. And when you consider that, you know, if this book was around for 17 years in 1980 and it's been established that Wolverine is for like, you know, over 100 and... I don't know, I think 150 years old. I can't remember what they, what year he was actually born. They said in Wolverine Origins. But in Marvel time, 17 years to us, and Marvel time was probably about eight years to them. So considering that uh, they started out as teenagers, that would kind of make them anywhere between 19 to 23, if I had to guess. Um, it's kind of creepy, you know. Oh, but I digress. But the love story of it here, is how it comes down to this thing started ending exactly how it needed to end. Um, when you are considered an outcast and you just have your friends, you know, you and your friends are all had that common factor that nobody likes us, but we'll, so we'll like each other. So you break down that group a little bit and you start realizing it doesn't matter if you're an outcast. 
as long as you have found that one person in your life that you love and they love you back. Because a lot, not a lot of people get to know the true love of a good woman, and not a lot of women end up getting the man they deserve. So with Scott and Jean, they had that. So when all, when the walls of hell were falling down upon them, and you know, you had everybody coming after you physically, literally, in every way possible, shape and form. They took a time in this story where Scott grabs her hand and he lets her know that he is still going to stand by her. And that's what made this story so good. This They have gotten mileage out of this story, okay? Gene and Scott come down to being on the moon by themselves, fighting the universe, more or less, coming down on them, you know, and they stuck together. They got mileage out of this. Jean Grey was never forgotten. Um, they messed with Cyclops, with Madeline Pryor, and went on. Rachel, the Phoenix has always been there. Jean Grey has always been there. Jean Grey came back. It's always, been, you know, and a lot of the X-Men stories are really still, a lot of fans who are still around still hold this as the standard. So I got a few more minutes here. So if you stuck with me this far, I'm going to be a little backstory there. I'm going to finish the story about that I started a minute ago about Jim Shooter and how he reacted when he saw the pages of X-Men, I think 136. So he comes in there and he sees this and he about blows a fuse, but he still stays professional and he goes to John Byrne and he goes to Chris Claremont and he's like, well, how are you going to end this? And it was going to be ended with an option that I've heard that Gene was going to be depowered and imprisoned. And Jim Shooter said, no, you can't do that. He was like the X-Men, if they stay in character, are going to be obsessed with breaking her out. And then they had another thing where maybe she's going to be a vegetable. And I think that one saw print in uh, How the Phoenix Should Have uh, What If Jean Grey Has Survived. And he was like, look, Jim Shooter said it's like this. That is the same thing as arresting Hitler for World War II and the Holocaust that he did and then handing him Germany back because he said he's sorry. And that's what I thought was interesting about Nightcrawler in the book when he was doing his retrospective. He was thinking about the Holocaust, where he's German and stuff. So basically they had to go back and re-script some of the book, and they had to redo the last five pages. So originally, where all the introspective is going on, and all the characters are spending their night thinking about things, all that is new dialogue. Those actually had different dialogue. <clears throat> so I also found that this is also the beginning and the end, the end of Jean Grey led to things with the book, which we'll save that for uh, next the next video. But it also led to the creative team starting to bust up. And it was supposedly all about the character. And the stories that have gone over the years over this, over how the Dark Phoenix saga was supposed to have ended with Jean Grey's death. Because uh, uh, it's just been immaculate. I've heard stories at a staff meeting, Chris Claremont jumped over a table and went after Byrne. I heard it the other way around. But basically what happened was is that Byrne felt like he was doing a lot more of the co-plotting from comic book lore uh, and that Claremont wasn't really true to character when it came to the actual characters in the book. So that's what he's saying that's why he wanted to leave. But it's also, I hear the ring of truth of that because this is also Shooter's thing. He, he wanted everybody to act in character. So that's my review. I hope you uh, liked it. A little bit more long-winded. I enjoyed it. And... From what I understand, there should be, I think, one more video after this, and we're going back to the Sage of the Dark Phoenix, the man who did the first video and started all this, Red Vitamin Blue. So check in with him tomorrow. Good read some comics.